I'm your host, Tyrell Bramwell. Our Lord wants to be with us, and we will be with him. Church. Turning to the LCMS on social media saying, yeah. The conduit. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I am Tyrell Bramwell. I'm the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California, and I'm also the host of this Alone Together in Christ live stream show right here on Facebook and then also posted on YouTube after the fact. So if you're watching this, thank you. Thank you for joining us and we're having some fun. We've been doing this since uh, March 31st when it really got settled into the whole stay at home here in uh, Ferndale, California and wanted to be able to reach out and talk to other pastors and other church members across the country, hopefully across the globe. Uh, I got to tell you, we do have a couple shows lined up. Exciting stuff. We're going to be able to talk to a chaplain who is serving in Afghanistan right now. Uh, Won't be live just for safety reasons, um, but we will be able to bring a pre-recorded interview with him soon. So probably sometime June. And then also started to reach out to, uh, we have some brothers over in Australia that are interested in talking to us. So that'll be fun interviews as well. So if you're just joining us, if you don't know what Alone Together in Christ is, it's a great time to join the show. Uh, it's, an, it's a work in progress. Every single week, it seems like something is shifting and changing just a little bit, trying to dial in certain things. So this week, we have the official In Christ added to the title, as Alone Together is a hashtag that's used by millions of people um, because of this pandemic. And we wanted to emphasize how we are truly able to be alone and yet together. It's not just because we have the same idea or we're trying to hoorah each other into positive thinking. It's because we're baptized into Christ. We are baptized into the one body of Christ. And therefore, no matter where you are in this world, even if you are completely alone, you are always together with the body of Christ, always in communion with our Lord in that way and with the saints of his church. And so that's what this show is about. And it's a great time to jump on board and uh, start watching. If you need to go back and binge watch the last 37 episodes, I highly recommend it. You'll have a blast. You'll meet a lot of pastors and even a few other people in the church as well. Uh, Last Friday, we talked to a cantor in Wyoming about music in the church. So things like that. Great show. Let's uh, dive into it. Let's get started. I'm going to bring on today's guest. I, I guess now that I see myself on the screen, I should probably tell you if you notice, the lighting has changed just a little bit. That's a, another tweak to the show. And it wasn't by choice, actually. I kind of liked the way the lighting was on Friday. But I was borrowing two light stands, two nice lights with soft boxes, And the guy I borrowed them from needed them back. So over the weekend, we figured out to do this. The light's a little harsh. You can see a little bit of a shadow on my face that I don't like. Kind of gross. But we'll work with it. All right, here we go. Let me bring on our guest today. The Reverend Steve Shav is the Director of Urban and Inner City Missions in St. Louis at LCMS, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. How are you, Pastor? Hey, I'm good. I'm very low tech over here, but that's uh, okay. I like your setup. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> um, you just jumped out of another meeting to join us, so thank you so much for yeah. your time and uh, taking a little bit of your, your morning, or well, almost, I guess it's getting to be afternoon where you're at, um, to join us. I really appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. What is going on from the director of urban and inner city missions perspective regarding this pandemic? Yeah, uh, I actually get to wear two hats for the LCMS. Uh, One is the urban inner city and the other is church planting. And both of them have been vastly affected by the pandemic. And when you think about the word urban, it might conjure up different thoughts, but really it's all about population density. Uh, So you can imagine in the days of social distancing and then also population density, uh, it's kind of a worst case scenario. So in our major cities, uh, it's very, very challenging right now. Uh, It's very difficult for uh, pastors uh, to serve their people. It's uh, difficult for our organizations to go do their mercy work. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, being social distance where 50 percent of the population all is huddled together in cities around the world, um, it's definitely making for some challenging times. Absolutely. What was uh, just so our viewers have a good perspective, what sort of um, work were you doing back in January? What was before we really started? Maybe even November. Let's go. Let's rewind back to maybe November or something. 
What was on yeah. the horizon for your workload before everything got thrown into chaos? <laughs> and uh, what was yeah? What were you thinking about as far as church planning and inner city mission? What was it? Yeah. What was a day in the life of Director Shav like? Yeah, so um, we were excited after the last convention and synod. We came up with this triennial emphasis on making disciples for life, and that's about reaching the least and the lost. And it's also about how do we retain people and keep them in the church um, to give them, you know, a life until a blessed death. And so we're pretty excited. We came off of our first conference, had really good conversations about how do you have uh, new mission work to new people groups and new places? How do we reach into our cities uh, to do mission work? Because, um, you know, obviously in the LCMS, uh, we're a little bit more leaning towards rural small towns. So uh, in our major cities, it's a great opportunity. And one of the convention, sorry to get bureaucratic, but one of the resolutions was you know, to fo- focus on uh, different ethnic groups and work in our urban core. And so we were pretty excited about making disciples for life and how uh, church planting was one of the major emphasis. So as you can imagine, uh, some of our most vulnerable work right now, uh, you can kind of picture if you did plant something and then all of a sudden this huge frost came yeah. and, you know, uh, that's pretty much what it feels like for a lot of our church planters and trying yeah. to start these new missions. They just started to bloom and then all of a sudden, you know, winter came out of nowhere and whacked them. What a great picture. I mean, especially (laughs) given that it's spring, right? And people, uh, I just talked to a a seminary professor who was talking about his garden and he was worried about the frost. So uh, what a great picture. And yeah, I can't imagine they're, they're just getting started. And then all of a sudden, so, so now this winter hits and what, what did it, what did it compel you to do in your position? Yeah, so I mean, we're trying to just be there to assist in any way we can. I mean, obviously, it begins with prayer to let folks know that we're, we're praying for them. Uh, we know God will provide. We're trying to provide resources um, because from the beginning, uh, even with our urban inner city mission webinars that we try to do, kind of host some subject matter experts. And we brought on Kay Wolf, who's known uh, throughout Synod, and she's done a lot with the LWML. And so she did uh, just a blunt conversation about how, how do you make sure that your church is welcoming? Because we realized even back in March uh, that for our, our churches, they're going to meet a lot of people now in their communities who is going to have their entire foundation rock beneath them all those pillars of science and medicine and politics and government and all those things they kind of look for for their sustaining um all that's been rocked and so a lot of people and i've been in all these national leader meetings for missions and and it's the same thing every time there are atheists who are out there who are praying They're trying to figure out, how do I pray? There are the people that are classified as the nuns, and they are out there and they're opening up their Bibles. And, you know, a vast majority of Americans right now see this as, you know, God getting our attention. So for all the talk about atheism and people don't believe, um, this is really brought out, um, and I, I guess you could just use the generic word anyways, of spirituality and even the hardest of unbelievers. And so um, we've really been trying to get people prepared to open up their doors wide and to roll out the red carpet because there's going to be I was just in a, a conference call with the, the CDC, and even they said there is going to be a wave, a literal tsunami of grief, uh, of trauma, and who, who are going to be the first responders? It will be the church. Wow. And so we're really trying to equip the church to be those first responders for all those people that dismiss the church, you know, against the church, all those things that we think of, especially in our major cities. A lot of people are starting to question and really look at and dive into their spirituality, and they're going to look to the church for some answers. So, in a, in a society that's pretty comfortable, I can see that happening, that all of a sudden— we have this thing hitting us that is is rocking our comfort levels, right? Shaking us to our core, and that's really fascinating. That um, atheists are praying and nuns are opening up their Bible. Wow! 
Uh, yeah. what, a, what a privilege exactly. to, to have someone. I really I, I feel very blessed that we in the LCMS have someone like yourself who is able to put his ear to those conference calls and be able to listen to what the CDC is saying and, and engage and, and interact with those communities so that we can then be equipped to take that information and you know, equip equip our, our people to use it with the gospel. That's a huge blessing as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. So we have our inner cities and, and especially, you know, I'm thinking New York City, um, things like that. Are you in direct contact with any particular pastors? Are they reaching out to, to LCMS and, and to you or and even our rural congregations? I mean, I'm in a very rural setting myself. And I can imagine that if I was just planting, if, if my church wasn't, you know, didn't have a long uh, hold here, if we were ba- a baby church, I would be reaching out to you like nobody's business <laughs> saying, what do I do? Uh, are you having a lot of those kind of phone calls? Yeah, sure. And I mean, there've been some nice group meetings too, just for everybody to, to commiserate and, you know, uh, as mutual consolation of the brethren and that, that sort of thing. And, um, yeah, we, we actually, our next webinar for our department is, uh, going to bring in the, the mission executive, uh, there in New York city to talk about what was this like in, at ground zero. And, and I'm excited about, uh, hearing some of the ways that people have engaged, um, I've heard so many good stories in the midst of this. I mean, yes, they're panicked and new start and all the rest, but I'm so uh, proud of how so many of these folks um, switch gears so quickly. So it might be somebody working with new Americans, uh, immigrants, refugees, and, you know, typically they're about long term, you know, provision. And now it's like, how do we just get these people their basic necessities? Yeah. Or it's, you know, homeless uh, families that are, Face, facing, you know, being out on the street, and and now we've equipped them to have a home and uh, to help them to rebuild their lives. But just these things that you don't really think about—they don't have a patio to sit out with their kids in the midst of quarantine, or their kids now are at home and they don't have the equipment and the tools that they need to be able to educate their children. But I'm so proud of how people have reached out to us for advice, but just how quickly they have been able to shift gears to meet the basic needs that people have. And then at the same time, as you were talking about, I was just coming out of a a meeting, it was talking about community development, looking at the the future and the long term. You know, we, we expect there to be a major economic impact on people that live in our, our cities and really anywhere. Um, but how, how do we deal with this workforce development? I mean, food pantries that have doubled, tripled in the amount of uh, folks that have come, the, you know, just the, the effect that has on a dad and his family that for the first time he's always been the provider, now suddenly finds himself with the, you know, kind of indignity of having to reach out to help. How do you care for that person spiritually and the fear that people have with their children being able to go back out? I mean, there are just so many different ways that we need to not only address the right here and now that we've tried to help our congregations and organizations, but how do we look at the future? And I mean, the the, the opportunity is just going to be abounding for us to be the church. I mean, that's why people are looking to us too, not just for the spiritual, but for centuries, we have been the ones on the ground showing mercy to the least uh, of us. And so uh, how, do, how do we really um, give God the glory and, and kind of take this opportunity to care for our neighbor and show love to those who most need it? So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And also, as I'm thinking, as you were talking, the other obstacle that I know as a parish pastor that I'm dealing with is the physicality of helping the, the, yeah. the inability to be a physical <laughs> presence. Right. So, yeah. um, I, I know you now other churches probably have different services. They provide their community that allow them to be qualified as, you know, essential and things like that, where they can still maintain food pantries and things. But just mm-hmm. from the specifically the pastoral care between, I'm thinking of the father you mentioned with suffering yeah. with that indignity, you know, yeah. um, he, he can't just come to a pastor in his study or, you know, in the sanctuary and just kind of lament with the man physically. It's all over the phone or over a text message. And, and that's a whole nother level of obstacle that, yeah. that we got to be equipped for. And 
Oh, what? it's brutal. The, the incarnational nature of what we do and the idea of being the communion of saints and everything that pervades what we do. I mean, and again, everything that we're doing, it's great. And it's great that we do even have these brand new ways to communicate that we wouldn't have had uh, in pandemics in the past. And yet at the same time, I really hope and pray that we see this as it's all leading up to something else, though. It's all putting us back in a trajectory towards the feast, you know, the the banquet in which the master sends out his servants into the streets and the alleys of the city, and he says, round up the lame and the blind and the poor and give them this invitation to my banquet. I hope we all see that these are great opportunities for witness and testimony and showing mercy, and yet it all should culminate back in that feast. And and that's where the, the trajectory it is. It's, it's not just giving somebody their temporal home that that's facing homelessness, but giving them the eternal home. It's giving them the robe of righteousness. It's giving them the food, uh, you know, that gives eternal life and the water uh, that they will never thirst again. So, mm -hmm. so we do all these things. We we have all these wonderful opportunities, um, but but ultimately speaking, it's it's about bringing them into into communion with us. Absolutely. Let me share with you a couple of greetings and blessings and uh, just perhaps shout outs. Let me look at the comments section here real quick. Kathy Sweet from my neck of the woods out here in California says blessings to you on this Monday morning. She wants to gr give uh, you, Pastor, her greetings. So Thank you. Also, Phil Allman says good morning and blessings to you and your family. All right. God bless you guys too. <laughs> and then let's see... Um, Mark Ingebrigtsen says, a real mission field in downtown San Francisco. And that's, that's out here in my neck of the woods, of course. Uh, yeah, the, any, any of these cities that are, yeah. that are that were already sort of dealing with you know, homelessness and, and those without what, right. daily bread and things, now it's even compounded further. And that's a right. major, major issue. Yeah, uh, those who are already most vulnerable have been hit the hardest. Um, there's no doubt. People who are already facing homelessness, the working poor, um, we really need to consider them uh, in our prayers and how we can reach out in mercy to those folks because it's been shown too, again, in, in all the meetings that I've been having, that those folks who are already kind of in the margins or already on the, the edge, they are definitely uh, most affected. Any, no doubt. Any tips for us who, uh, you know, we're not in direct contact with someone like yourself on a regular basis because we're not a startup and, and we're not necessarily inner city. We're just sort of your mm -hmm. typical Missouri Synod church. Uh, yeah. Any tips for us on how we can you know, start to uh, develop a perspective to be prepared for this? Yeah, I think um, some of the things that it's, it's interesting, the city is kind of considered to be a magnifying glass. So when you, when you densely populate sinners, uh, bunch them up together uh, sinners do what sinners do, but it seems to be kind of a magnifying glass. And so what I think you'll see coming out of the city is some of the worst of the worst things uh, many times, but some of the best of the best things in terms of how we can rally together. And I think you'll find that in whatever community that you're in, uh, you can kind of take that as how, how uh, we work together and collaborate uh, to serve our neighbor. Um, I think it's about how do we identify some of those uh, needs that people have both in the spiritual sense, uh, but also in their human care needs. Um, because all the social issues are across the board, you know, whether it's child abuse, domestic violence, opioid uh, addiction, you know, all, all those things that already uh, pervade no matter what your context they're only going to get worse as this goes on. So how do you look at your community and be the ones to collaborate with the, the right people to make a difference and to understand what are the assets that we all have and how do we put them all together to help in such a, a difficult situation? But again, realizing that all those things that are kind of, even in our small towns, maybe a little bit more hidden, you don't know that that guy is suffering from his uh, painkiller becoming an opioid epidemic. They do a better job of hiding that there's domestic violence. All those things are still happening, but how do I, how do I get the right people and collaborate uh, and identify what are the assets that my community have? Um, 
uh, work is going to be a huge thing. And so we were just talking about community development. Um, so many more people are going to find themselves unemployed. How do we all work together to help this person to have those first article gifts? Uh, and how do we address some of those deep spiritual needs that I just said of all those different yeah. issues yeah. that are just going to get worse? Thank you so much. And one more question for you, Pastor, as we're starting to wind down our time, and I don't want to take too much of yours. Uh, could, could you leave us, uh, everybody who's watching this, with a pastoral comment of encouragement as we're looking at doing this good work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's 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 hard, too, when you think about the church and, you know, it, when we think of the city, especially the animosity that the world has for us as Christians. And, you know, a lot of us feel that we've been uh, singled out and unjustly treated. And, you know, two things kind of come to mind for me. One is Joseph. You know, Joseph, the suffering servant who was betrayed, uh, thrown in the pit, you know, and yet how when God gave him the opportunity, rather than to retaliate against those who had persecuted him, he opened up the storehouses to care for others, right? And I think that's what God is calling the church to do again that we've done over the centuries. Or when you think about Nineveh and how Jonah, he knew that the very people that he was bringing life and salvation to would destroy his people. You know, he, he knew that these were the people that persecuted him. And the last thing that he wanted to do was to tell them a message of repentance and forgiveness because he knew who God was. And he knew uh, he knew that God would relent and forgive them and bring them salvation. Um, and yet it's the first time that we see in Scripture where God gives this odd reason for why, Jonah, you'll go into the city and you'll preach my message of repentance and forgiveness. If for no other reason, there are just so many lost souls. When you look at the United States of America that's hurting, reeling, suffering, grieving, and trauma, God is telling us, just look, there are so many lost souls. Bring them my love. Open the storehouses. The world may hate you, and that's exactly what I said would happen. The world will crucify you, and yet you have been sent as my servant to love and to care for your neighbor for no other reason than there are just so many lost souls that need Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and I know our viewers do as well. Um, love the, the pictures from the Old Testament. Hadn't really thought about them, those particular issues. And that's why it's so good to talk with other pastors to, you know, <laughs> to hear these things. Because you know, my perspective goes down one avenue, and then uh, you've been thinking about it from a whole other way. And what beautiful biblical uh wisdom thank you so much well Amen. we'll let you be and uh maybe check back in with you as time goes on and things start to progress and we start to open back up as an entire country be happy to talk more with you and see what, what's going on in the inner inner cities and those rural uh plants right thank you brother well, thanks for having me it's been great absolutely and we'll talk with you soon for everyone right. else i want to point you to pastor shav's uh, contact information or at least the information for the LCMS Office of uh, International Mission there in uh, St. Louis. And I think I got this information correct. Now, I know I got the address right, but there's a lot of different ways you can contact the LCMS. So uh, if these numbers don't take you directly to where I think they're supposed to take you, just ask someone to transfer you and you'll get to the right person. So it's 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. Also, the phone number you can call is 1-800-248-1930. If you want to reach out via email, it's mission.advancement at lcms.org. And their website, of course, is lcms.org. You can find them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. The Missouri Synod, as a synod-wide entity, has a presence on all of those social medias. So uh, definitely take the time to reach out. And if you know of something or need something from them, they are the most helpful people on the planet. So uh, don't hesitate. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for uh, watching and supporting and your comments. I hope you had a great weekend and rested up well. And we're now going to kick into another week of Alone Together in Christ. We have a full lineup for you until Friday. And um, also double duty this week because I won't be streaming live next week, but there'll be pre-recorded episodes on the normal Monday through Friday uh, so that you're not going to miss a single episode, even though I can't be streaming live. And uh, just going to you know, 
give you some great content. We've got some great pastors lined up talking to amazing people. I feel blessed to be able to talk to all these guys and all these different people in the church, and then also blessed to be able to deliver the goods to you and let you talk to them, uh, kind of, sort of, through your comments and interact with them. Remember, the comment feed doesn't go away just because the live feed is over. The, uh, the video is archived here on Facebook, and you can keep the conversation going just as long as you'd like. Same with YouTube. Let me throw up this screen. If you're watching on YouTube, remember to give the, the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to the channel and uh, click that notification bell so you know when new videos are posted. They're posted generally by noon every day. By the time I have a chance to uh, render out this file and upload it onto the channel, it's about noon by the time it gets there. But um, sometimes it's a little later. Just click that notification bell and you'll know when it goes up. Uh, tomorrow's show, let's talk about that. We're going to go to Our Savior Lutheran Church in Marlette, Michigan. Talk with the Reverend David Sutton, who is pastor there, and see what's going on. Michigan, as you've been watching in the news, is quite a controversial state given all of this uh, pandemic and the governor's actions. So we'll see how it's affecting our Savior and the pastor, David Sutton. With that said, I really appreciate you tuning in, liking, subscribing, and sharing, and doing all the social media stuff. We'll talk to you tomorrow.